As all of you know, this report tries to monitor progress towards the globally agreed targets. And we are now only eight years away from 2030, but as we show in this report, the distance to reach many of these SDG2 targets is growing wider each year. But the report doesn't want to stay just by giving the photograph, which is not a good photograph, as this was mentioned before, but also to try to dig deeper how we can handle with existing budgets and existing government support in food and agricultural sector to try to improve and move, accelerate the process to the food system transformation. But let me, before we move into the, into the details of the report and the results of the report, let me first go through some clarification of the core definitions that we use so that nobody gets confused with the different numbers. This report works with two core definitions. The first one is chronic undernourishment, which is severe food insecurity and is a long-term inability to meet food requirements. The second definition is moderate or severe food insecurity combined and is when people face uncertainties about their ability to obtain food and have been forced to compromise on the nutritional quality or quantity of food that they consume. And the third definition, which is not in this report, but is in the Global Food Crisis Report, is crisis level acute food insecurity, which is the sporadic sudden crises that can limit people's ability and access to food in the short term to the point that their lives and livelihoods are at risk. The numbers of chronic undernourishment reported on SOFI and the numbers of people facing crisis level acute food insecurity reported in the Global Food Crisis Report are not comparable. One is chronic, long-term, the other one is short-term. But if people facing acute food insecurity get the assistance they need in the short-term, their situation will not become chronic. So for this year, and as you have heard, for chronic undernourishment, we are facing as much as 828 million people facing hunger in 2021. For moderate and severe food insecurity, there are 2.3 billion people that lack access to adequate food in 2021. And for acute food insecurity, we have, according to the Global Food Crisis Report, based on IPC acute food insecurity assessments in food crisis countries, it was reported 193 million people in 53 countries and territories in 2021. But in addition, WFP has done also an effort through their CARI survey to increase the number of countries to 82, applying their methodology to additional 29 countries to the ones of the IPC, the 53 countries. And these reports bring up to the 345 million people in 82 countries with acute food insecurity in June 2022 that was reported by David Besley. So it's very important to understand those differences. So now let me move quickly uh, with the numbers because you have heard all of them. Of course, we have the 828 million people that face hunger. The pandemic has widened existing inequalities, heightening the challenge of eradicating hunger. And our update, updated projections indicate that more than 670 million people may still be hungry in 2030, far from the zero hunger target and the level that was in 2015, the year where the SDGs were agreed. Beyond hunger, more than 2.3 billion people in the world lack access to adequate food in 2021. Moderate or severe food insecurity remain stable at global level, but severe food insecurity increased globally and in every region of the world. It's important to mention, as, as the DSG mentioned, Amina Mohammed, that there has been some progress towards some global nutrition targets, including child stunting and exclusive breastfeeding but we are not moving at the velocity that we need to move to achieve the targets that we have in place. And there are others on the wrong direction, adult obesity and anemia in women, things that can be resolved, especially anemia, in a very short term. Adult obesity is on the rise in all regions of the world, having increased worldwide from 11.8% in 2012 to 13.1% in 2016. And here we still have a huge gap of data because we don't have numbers later than 2016. And finally, the access to healthy diets and affordability of healthy diets, which reveal 122 million people 
were more unable to afford healthy diets in 2020 than in 2019. And again, this reflects the increase in prices and why, that's why we are today in 3.1 billion people that cannot afford healthy diets. Here we just show the trend and how the trend is evolving. And please note at the end of the last two years that we look at a confidence interval because agriculture now has significant uncertainties. The shocks that we are observing, the COVID-19, the war in Ukraine, those are uncertainties. And it's very difficult to have exact numbers at this point. That's why we talk about upper and lower limits. But in general, you can see clearly how the numbers are going up and how we can see that chronic undernourishment has been increasing. Even if we project the impacts of Ukraine, of Ukraine war or the war in Ukraine, we will see that we will have at, at most up to 13 more million people in 2022 in chronic undernourishment in addition to what we have today. And in 2023, the number could go up to 17 more million people in chronic undernourishment. Now, after increasing from 2019 to 2020 in most African, Asian, Latin America, and the Caribbean, hunger continued to rise in all regions of the world in 2021, but at a lower pace. In 2021, hunger affected 278 million people in Africa, 425 million people in Asia, and 56.5 million people in Latin America and the Caribbean. More than half of the people in the world facing hunger in 2021 were in Asia and more than one third in Africa. Compared with 2029, the largest increase was observed in Africa, both in terms of percentage and number of people. The increase in Africa was driven largely by rising hunger in middle Africa, where prevalence of undernourishment increased four percentage points in two years to about 33% in 2021, affecting nearly one third of the population. The rising hunger in Asia was driven mostly by Southern Asia, which is also the sub-region with the largest number of people facing hunger. Nearly 617 million people may still be facing hunger in 2030, based on updated projections of the prevalence of undernourishment far from zero hunger target. The pandemic implies an increase of 78 million undernourished people in 2030. Significant improvements are foreseen for Asia by 2030, while the situation projects to worsen and even Africa to catch Asia by 2030. The same figure we observe when we look at our indicator of food insecurity experience scale of moderate and severe food insecurity. But the important thing here is that after increasing sharply in 2020, the global prevalence of moderate or severe food insecurity remained mostly unchanged in 2021, although we were expecting it to reduce. But the severe food insecurity consistent to our POU indicator, our chronic undernourishment, rose higher. And the region where the increase is the highest is Latin America and the Caribbean. And that's a big surprise because this is the breadbasket of the world where most of the food is being produced. So we need to look at the problems carefully and we need to find solutions to all the regions and try to understand how things are changing. Now, the food security situation also has deteriorated more for some population groups than others. Women, for example, have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 pandemic and its lingering consequences. They suffer greater job and income losses during the pandemic and bore a larger burden of the additional caregiving looking after sick family members and children out of the school. The gender gap in food insecurity, which has grown in 2020 under the shadow of the COVID-19 pandemic, widened even further from 2020 to 2021. This was driven largely by the widening differences in Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as in Asia. In 2021, 31.9% of women in the world were moderately or severely food insecure compared to 27.6% of men. So the inequalities in gender has increased in the topics of food insecurity. Although it is still not possible to fully account for the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic due to the challenges in updated nutrition indicators, it is clear, as you can see in this graph, that the immense efforts will be required to reach the 2030 global nutrition targets. Most of the indicators are not on the correct direction, 
with the exceptions of stunting and breastfeeding. But it's important to understand also that there has been structural challenges because of COVID-19 in all the school feeding programs, in all the vaccination mechanisms that were happening, and those we will have significant costs in the health and nutrition of our children and our people. So there is important work that we need to implement, and member states have to implement their nutrition-related commitments made at the United Nations Food Systems Summit and the Tokyo Nutrition for Growth Summit by intensifying their efforts and scaling up their activities as appropriate under Nutrition Dec Decades Work Program. Finally, within our indicators, almost 3.1 billion people, as I mentioned before, could not aff afford a healthy diet. 112 million more than in 2019, reflecting the inflation in consumer food prices stemming from the economic impacts of COVID-19 pandemic and the measure put in place to contain it. This has affected enormously the informal sector because of the long periods that we have people holding their houses and we stop economic activities. These were people that before were not poor, were middle class, and now suddenly they are starting to move into poverty and extreme poverty in some cases and hard facing significant challenges of hunger. All regions saw an increase in the number of people who could not afford a healthy diet, and the largest numbers were in Asia, where 78 million more people were unable to afford this diet in 2020 compared to 2019. This was followed by Africa, where 25 million people were not able to afford these diets, and to a lesser extent by Latin America and the Caribbean, and North America and Europe. Latin America and the Caribbean had the highest cost of a healthy diet compared to other regions in 2020. Again, another contradiction. And this is followed by Asia, Africa, North America, and Europe, and Oceania. Between 2019 and 2020, Asia witnessed the highest surge in the cost of healthy diets. So what we can do, and what we are trying to push in this SOFI publication? The setbacks that we are seeing in food insecurity are enormous, and they are a significant challenge. And we need to move towards an agri-food system transformation, and we need to create a change. The problem today is that we don't have resources. Most of the countries, the most vulnerable ones, are highly indebted. And developed countries also have significant financial problems because of the COVID-19 pandemic. The economic prospects for 2022 have been revised downwards significantly. And this means less financial resources are available to invest in the agri-food systems. So what we try to do here is to work with the resources that exist there, but to make them more efficient more effective, to orient the incentives towards what we are aiming to, to more healthy diets, more access to more nutritious foods. So SOFI reports try to show how governments can achieve more with the same public resources. Today, especially in high and upper middle income countries, governments are expending significant public resources to support food and agriculture. But the different support measures being used as are displayed in this figure can distort prices, trade, production, and consumption decisions. Worldwide, support to food and agriculture accounted for $630 billion per year on average over 2013 and 2018. Producers take the lion's share of all this support globally, about 70%. About $111 billion were spent yearly by governments for provision of general services to the sector, while food consumers receive 72 billion on average per year. Most of the support producers get is through price incentives. And these include border measures on imports and exports, such as import tariffs against trade, quotas, export taxes, bans, licensing. So we are creating distortions. Also, market and price controls, things that we know are not efficient and minimum producer price policies. Overall support to agricultural production largely concentrates on staple foods, dairy and other animal source protein rich foods, especially in high and upper middle income countries. Rice, sugar and meats of various types are the foods most incentivized worldwide, while producers of fruits and vegetables are less supported overall or even penalized in some low income countries. So colleagues, this needs to change. We are doing the opposite that we are talking. We need to change abruptly what is happening. And this report presents scenarios up to 2030 
where we public support to farmers is reallocated by all countries to prioritize the production or consumption of those foods whose current consumption levels are below the necessary dietary requirements of healthy diets. We call these foods priority foods and are targeted in these scenarios. If you look at this graph, you will see in green the fiscal subsidies to consumers, in orange the fiscal subsidies to producers, and in blue, light blue, price incentives. Just if we look at the price incentives, we will see that if we change and repurpose them properly, we'll also reduce the cost of nutritious foods, which is what we want, so we can have better access and affordability to healthy diets. But greenhouse gas emissions will fall also, without other trade-offs seen in repurposing fiscal subsidies. So it's an option that could help us to improve the way we produce and to target properly what we really want to incentivize today. Other types of repurposing, like for example, fiscal subsidies to consumers, what we have here in green, could create a significant negative effect to farmers, although it could increase affordability to healthy diets. But will also create some other effects that we need to look at. So understanding the trade-offs of the choices we make will be central for the future and to be able to make policies that really move towards what we are saying and what is being recommended. There are other important considerations for policymakers when considering opportunities for repurposing border measures, price controls, and fiscal subsidies to consumers. We need, to com we need commitments and flexibilities, and we need to follow what we have agreed with the WTO rules. Repurposing of support may not be fully equitable, and here is where we need to bring ways to support the ones that we lose. So to avoid the trade-offs, it may be necessary to set up new fiscal subsidies to consumers or use proper social protection systems. Where agriculture is still to the economy and job generation, governments should spend more in a well-prioritized provision of general services. And international development finance will be needed for low-income countries and perhaps lower middle-income countries, given that they have smaller amounts of mechanisms of resources to repurpose. So colleagues and excellencies, in conclusion, this year's report should dispel any lingering doubts that the world is moving backwards in its efforts to end hunger, food insecurity, and malnutrition in all its forms. The current recessionary context made it even more challenging for many governments to increase their budgets to invest in agri-food system transformation. At the same time, much can and needs to be done with existing resources. This is the third year I personally come to report to these sessions, and it's the third year that we come with bad news. It's very important that the next year we come with good news. Thank you.